Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to JCAL Talks. My name is Leonard Jacobs. I'm the executive director here at the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. Uh, for those of you that have been watching on YouTube this season and sometimes coming in person, JCAL Talks is our speaker series where we sit down with thought leaders from Queens in areas of arts and culture and civic and community life. Um, tonight, we are honored to have two guests. We have Frank Wu, the president of Queens College, and Jeff Rosenstock, who I've known longer than I care to admit for a very long time. You are the assistant vice president uh, at Queens College Correct. as well. Um, gentlemen, thank you for, for coming tonight. Um, Queens College is, as you may know, and, and I, I have to do this. My mom's watching. Um, uh, as you may know, I grew up across the street from Queens College. Queens College has been very good to my family and my mom in particular, who worked there for many, many years. And it's so important to the borough in terms of arts and culture. And that's why I'm just tickled to, to have you both here, because there's a lot to cover. There's a lot going on. Um, I think what I'd love to do, if I could, is just ask you to quickly just talk a little bit about yourselves. Um, and Frank, I have to say, your your passion for arts and culture is sort of your trademark, I think, in in your in your tenure at Queens College and even before that. So feel free to talk about that all you want, because I think our, all of our um, viewers will eat that up. All right. Well, I'm a kid from Detroit, the the Motor City, but I'm one of those New Yorkers who had to find my way here. So I'm thrilled to be here. Been here for about two years. And I didn't set out to be a college president. I wanted to be the Queens College president. And the reason for that, it really is true. That was the only search that I was in. You know, I had had roles where these headhunters, they call you from time to time. And they say, oh, are you interested in this, interested in that? I didn't want just to be in charge of something. I wanted to be in charge of something that had a mission. And Queens College is a civic institution. We, we believe in something, seems old fashioned now, higher education is the engine of the American dream. That this is how, not just you as an individual, but your family, your whole community, they move up. Because we know that so many of our students, they're the first in their family, first among all their cousins, right, uh, to have an opportunity for higher education. Some of them are the first to be born on these shores, right? Their parents came here, whether it's from Europe or Latin America, Asia or Africa, and they know that this is their chance. So what I say to our students is, your family is like my family. That's how I got here. My parents came to the United States as scholarship students. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for American higher education. And it's not just that we believe in higher education. We are in a place, and this isn't my opinion, it's not my say, so it's statistically, we're the most diverse place in the world. When you look at how many languages are spoken, right, right on our campus, we, we study this every year. Our students in their homes, they speak 100 languages. That's more languages than I knew people were actually <laughs> speaking regularly <laughs> now. Uh, but it's true. and. They're all united by this passion to improve themselves in, in life. That's why I'm here. And arts is a part of that. I know you got to put food on the table. That's number one priority. But as soon as you're OK, as soon as you know that you're going to have a roof over your head, you're hungry for something more. And that means creativity, expression, whether you're a performer, an audience member, or a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Everyone, no matter what their ethnicity, what their faith, what their station in life, everyone has in them this desire for expression, mm -hmm. right? Uh, to, to celebrate. And, and for many people, it's so compelling. You can't imagine a life where you're not doing that. But even if, you, if you're not obsessed that way, we all, we all need culture. This is, this is what gives our lives meaning. It's how we find meaning. It's how we, we ask and answer the big questions. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. And, and I see Queens College as having not just a mission for our students, but a role as a civic institution for the whole borough. 
Now, Mr. Rosenstock, right. you know all I'm about what I'm going to fill a little bit more about <laughs> Frank Wu, too. Which, uh, Frank was the first Asian American professor at Howard University, a historically black college and university, and wasn't just there for a year or two, but actually for an entire decade, and um, has done a lot of work in DEI. He authored a book called Yellow, and I know when I met the uh, deputy borough president or acting borough president, Sharon Lee, and I said, Frank Wu, she went, I read that book when I was in college. I read that book, um, you know, and he really, for someone like me, I'm Jeff Rosenstock, I'm the AVP of External and Government Affairs, but I also oversee the professional arts organization. So having somebody like Frank who totally gets the value of culture and arts and its impact on a community, it's wonderful to have a boss like that. Uh, well, I, I'll return the compliment by saying, it's not an accident that Jeff wears two hats because these are part, really, of the same mission. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, he helps us interact with everyone out there in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Local, state, federal officials, um, to help persuade them of the value of public higher education, to make the investment, to, to help support us. And on the other hand, he oversees all the programming. We have the largest indoor venue in the entire borough, Colton Auditorium, seats about 2,100. So what I explain to people is even if you didn't graduate from Queens College, you probably graduated at Queens College. <laughs> As did I. Yeah, yeah. Your junior yeah. high or high that's school, right. they, they, all those commencements are held on our stage yep. because that's a role that we play. Uh, and it's an important role because you have to have civic space like this. And during the pandemic, I think we, we came, became more aware of it because of its absence. You need a place where you bump into people, sure, right? Where, where you meet new friends, where you see old friends, where, where you right. know you can gather safely and, and where you can express yourself. It's mm -hmm. it just places that you can go in a crowded city, places that you can go where you know you'll be entertained and educated, sometimes a little provoked. Those are important to have. So I'm glad to, to be able to work with uh, Jeff, who has a uh, theater background. He ran the Queens Theater. He founded it uh, in the park and then uh, a few years back uh, was doing a little work to help Queens College think about mm -hmm. this vision for the arts. Right. And he did such a, a good job that he wrote his own job description and then got himself <laughs> hired. True. We're going to talk about something called Queens Rising in about a minute, because that's the, that's the direction that, that we're headed. Um, and I was going to say, you know, you were talking about the importance of self-expression and creativity. I always kind of flinch when people say, oh, I'm not creative. Everybody is creative in different ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, not everyone is necessarily a sculptor or a composer or a writer, but everybody has creativity. And everybody, I think, has a right to access or identify or cultivate their creativity. And the thing about civic spaces, um, particularly our city university system, which is really just the crown jewel here in New York, right? Um, is it gives you the, the space and the permission and the encouragement, the inspiration very often um, to, to uh, have an interaction with that creativity that you don't necessarily get in any other space. Mm -hmm. um, you said something before, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deviate from the script just ever so slightly, <laughs> just because you mentioned the pandemic and when I was, when I was rereading some of the materials. So you became the president of Queens College in, in the middle of 2020. So your timing is spectacular. Right. <laughs> uh, what was that like, if I may ask you? Because you're talking about gathering safely, and it was a time when we couldn't gather. Uh, uh, right. It was uh, a crazy time for yeah. the first six months. I did my job from my apartment, and I would get on one of these platforms that we've learned to use, such as Zoom, and I'd, I'd look at everyone. And I hadn't met folks, and I would say, please, don't come to campus. <laughs> Let's just stay where you are. This right. is before we had vaccines or anything. We, we didn't quite know what was going on. But Queens, remember, well, you, you know this. It was the center of the center. You bet. And in the early days, it didn't look like this was going to be national, global. But Queens was hard hit. We just held a memorial on our campus. And at least 40 people died of COVID. This is direct stakeholders, right? students, faculty, staff, alumni, that we know of. And mm -hmm. some people are private, and sometimes you don't know. Mm -hmm. That doesn't include the family members. When you add that up, it's a huge number. And this is in a short time frame. So 
it, it was a terrible, crazy time that in fits and starts we're finally coming out of. And it was a time where for some people in the world, they saw more urgently the importance of being united, that the, the social contract became clear, right? If I'm wearing a face mask, that helps me, but it helps you. If I get vaccinated, it helps me, but it helps you, right? And, and vice versa. We're, we're right. doing this for one another. Right. And regrettably, it's also a time when some have really sought to divide mm -hmm. us. And for most of my tenure in this role, everyone's been on edge, sort of anxious, mm -hmm. because you can't even have conversations with people anymore. You can't talk to them about face masks, right? That's become political, mm -hmm. like you might get in a fist fight. Um, you can't even talk about the weather, right? Because if, if you say something about the weather, people think you're talking about climate change, and they might be a climate change <laughs> denier, and then you know that sets them off. And, and even now, and we know this, as we come back in person, there's still some people, and I understand, because this member of my family who has an immune issue, there's some people, they still haven't ventured out, mm -hmm. right? They, they got their 96-year-old grandmother living with them. Mm -hmm. They want to be super cautious. A absolutely, I, I, I support that. And then for some people, young people, our students, they missed a year. They missed two years. And a lot of folks, and you don't have to be a young person, folks of every age, you, you come back and you don't know how close to stand to people. You don't know, are we shaking hands today? Or, or are, we, are we just keeping our distance? Uh, you might have to ask because you're yeah, not sure. And, yeah, and, and it's been a while since people have mixed and mingled with people they don't know, right? We were all in our little pods, and now suddenly I'm meeting people again, and it's awkward, right? Because yeah, we've been, been sheltered for two years. Right. Yeah. I'm curious if you have a, if, for both of you, if you have an opinion about how this, this will bring us to the School of the Arts, which you just unveiled, and I'm going to ask you to talk about it, both of you. I'm just curious if you have a point of view around how this is changing the role of the artist to our society. That is to say, my personal opinion, artists are always the canaries in the coal mine. Artists are always the one that are going to lead us forward, even if we don't know it explicitly in the moment, right? It was an extraordinarily terrible time for arts and culture. I mean, we're sitting in a, in a black box theater that was just bereft of human beings at all, ever, um, for months and months and months. And when we've had a number of occasions here in this house when, when we've had quite a few people, and it's one of those you have to read the room, and are you know, people going to be masked, or are they not masked? And we're a city-owned building, so if the mayor says, do it this way, we're going to do it that way. If the mayor lifts it, you know, and... Um, and yet you've got actors and musicians that are just desperate to perform, mm -hmm. even though they've been able to perform now for a year or so, right, indoors. It's such a big deal. The need to self-express cannot be bottled up and unreleased for any length of time, right? So on the one hand, maybe I'm answering your question for you, and now that letting you answer the question, I apologize. I just, I, I'm just curious if you have a point of view about how this is affecting artists in terms of their need to, to create and self-express. Jeff? Jeff. I, I think <laughs> artists have found that. Yesterday, there was a memorial service CUNY-wide at uh, City University. And we were asked to provide a performance component. We is the CUNY Dance Initiative, which is a, a citywide initiative. And it was a piece created on a carpet by a choreographer. So the entire, the four dancers were dancing on a, a, a small carpet, smaller than this you know, area over here. And people just learned. They still needed to create. They still needed to express themselves. There was a lot to say you know, right now for artists. That too much to say you know, about our world and how it's changing. Uh, but I also think I, I went to Flushing Town Hall to see one of our colleagues perform right at the onset of people coming back. And their director, Ellen Koderdak, was doing her curtain speech and broke down in tears. I know she did. I were, know. There were people, I was one of them, sitting in this audience. And it was my first chance to be with other people 
watching something again, not on Zoom. You know, and, and I always believe very, very strongly that a performance is also about the audience seeing themselves as much as the audience interacting with the artist. And there's a sense of community because we live in a certain neighborhood or we've come together and that's equally important to the relationship between the artist and the audience. So I am so happy that we're coming back to live events and there are some risks we have to take, but I think they're worth taking. Months and months ago, we had a, an, a, a gallery exhibit here. We, we would have these rotating exhibits, but the only thing we could do is live stream an artist talk, mm -hmm. like one person and a camera person 20 feet away, right? And the first time we had an appreciable group of people in our gallery, I, I filmed it with my phone, and I'll never delete it, because I, had, I remember Ellen calling me yeah. and telling me that she got emotional, and I felt the same way at that event. These buildings are meant to have people in them. And, and to have all these people show up, and yes, they were all masked, and we had like snacks for them and people going in the corner, because we're all trying to figure out in that moment how to navigate through the moment. But having all those human beings here to look at work was extraordinary. And it was only for me maybe made extraordinary, all the more extraordinary for having been denied that for so long. There is no segue to talk about Queens College School of the Arts, so I'm just going to segue directly <laughs> into Queens College School of the Arts. But um, Queens College just had this wonderful uh, event on campus. I was very honored to give remarks. Thank you for the opportunity. And I was wondering if you could both talk about what it is, how it came about, what was necessary to make it happen, and anything else that you would like to say about it. This is the best free advertising in Queens. All right. So when I showed up, I looked around, and I thought, wait a minute. We have the Aaron Copeland School of Music. We have drama, theater, dance. We have writing. We have graphic design. We have visual arts. We have ceramics. We have MFA programs. Looks to me like we have everything for an art school. We've just never put together. Now we've put together. It's the first, it's the only comprehensive art school in the entire city University of New York system, which is the largest urban system in the entire nation. And at the heart is the Aaron Copeland School. Um, I'll share with you a, a brief anecdote about something that inspired me that's related to the pandemic. So uh, this animated movie came out, Soul. It's one of these Pixar movies, and, uh, and I watched it. Great movie. If you haven't seen it, I commend it to you. It's, a, it's about a jazz musician. Right? So he's a jazz musician by night, a high school band teacher by day. It's set in Queens. Huh. That's really good. A and I watched it before I knew something, right? So I watched this, then I found out that the producers, they wanted to bring to life, you know, this is all animated, they wanted to bring to life this character in the borough, and they, they were having difficulty, you know, making it realistic, making it compelling. And, th and this is one of those movies, you don't have to be a kid. I mean, kids will enjoy it, but it's actually even more thoughtful, the themes, I, I won't ruin it for you, uh, but it's not at all what you think of as a cartoon, right? right? But the producers were having trouble. You, know, you just kind of get the tone right. So they called the Copeland School and they said, you know, is there, is there someone you have who uh, could talk to us? So one of our graduates, a fellow named Peter Archer, class of 1985, became the behind the scenes model for the main character. He's, he's got this mustache and they, 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 when you see the cartoon character, I said to him, you should get the cartoon version of you <laughs> you know, it's, it's got the mustache. I mean, they made it. They made him a cartoon, right? Okay, sure. so it's not actually him, but and it's voiced by Jamie Fox, you know, Hollywood star. But he helped them, and he told them his whole life story, and they brought him to life on on the screen. That's an example. We we have folks who come from around the world to study jazz, a program f uh, founded by Jimmy Heath, who passed away during the pandemic. We're going to celebrate with a memorial concert, and there's going to be a street in Corona named for him just this Friday. That jazz program is amazing. I, I, I'm a huge jazz fan, so I, I've been out to, to listen to uh, uh, Ron Carter, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Charlap, John Pizzarelli, and a couple of the venues I've gone to, I've bumped into people who, as you kind of you're sitting in the bar, you chat. There are alumni from the Copeland School, or in some way they've played a gig with someone at the Copeland School. Right. So I realized, wow, 
this is for real. So we built an entire art school around this. And when I looked at everything else that we had, it's that quality too. You know, we have novelists, we have poets who are teaching novelists and poets. Right. We opened this art school on Cinco de Mayo. Mm -hmm. It's also Asian American Heritage Month mm -hmm. and Jewish Heritage. One of the things I said when we had the, the big party was, it's great that there are so many ethnicities that are celebrating right now because arts are for everyone. And that's what we want folks to know. This is an art school for the world. This is an art school for the world's borough. And the last thing I'll say, we opened a business school at the same time. The reason we did that, I like to be college with a double major because I know for many of our students, they got immigrant parents, or they got parents who are just very practical minded, right? Because the parents maybe didn't finish high school, right? Kid gets into Queens College and they, they want their son or daughter to be able to, to earn a good living. I want them to be very practical. Yeah, be a business person, be an accounting major, maybe science, but liberal arts, what, what, what's that? Music, drama, what, what a waste of your time and money. I, I know this because that's what my life was like when I went off to college. My parents were horrified, they thought. All the sacrifices we've made for you and your brothers, and you're going to throw it away by doing what? <laughs> Studying writing? That was yeah. your major? Yeah, yeah. and, and I've you made a pretty good that. living. You destroyed you, right? <laughs> but I want to say to our students, it's okay, be a double major. I don't want you to wake up when you're 40 and you were an accounting major and you never took a dance class. I don't want you to be a dancer who wakes up and you can't pay rent. Right. Be an accounting major, a dance minor, do both. Someday, run a place like this. Go right. to arts administration because to, to do something like this, you need to know a little bit of business. Right. And you need to know a little bit of art. And there are so many jobs and so many careers and so many lives that depend on doing more than one thing. I, I say to the students when they show up, if you can only do one thing, no matter how good you are at that, the word for you is obsolete. <laughs> maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but mm -hmm. soon. Because unless you're able to adapt, the world is changing, it's the only constant. And so I want them to do both. Come to both our business school and our art school. Your parents will be happy, you'll be happy, and someday, you'll run the Jamaica Center for the Arts. Yeah. So assuming that my parents are still watching this, my father <laughs> is sitting there nodding his head saying, we told him have a fallback. We told him to have a fallback. You know, one of the things that um, I think was inculcated less when I was an undergrad, that was in a year that began with 19. It was a whole other century ago. Um, but I think it's much more now um, if you're an artist, you're still running a business. The business is you. That's right. But making that point is very, very clear. Um, I, I now, I will confess, I did not go to Queens College for school. I went to a private university um, located oh. in New York City. Do you forgive me? Oh, come back and get your master's with I, us. Uh, I've got one. <laughs> I, uh, maybe I'll get another. But um, Come back and teach. That's a possibility. Um, but I remember uh, my contemporaries getting out of acting school and not not knowing things like trim your resume so that it fits your eight by ten, right? Mm -hmm. um, just learning some basic business skills about if you're. I, I was in the theater. It was my first love, passion, background, and uh, 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 and a lot of these um, young, to me now, kids. Uh, they didn't understand how to balance a checkbook. They didn't understand anything about finance. Uh, you have to business. know that, uh, right? Of course it is. Shakespeare yeah. wasn't just a playwright. He That's helped right. to run right. a company. Right. 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 Yep. Not easy. Yeah. Another aspect of the school, and I've been working very closely with the dean, Bill McClure, and um, with the faculty, it wasn't just, OK, let's just combine these things, but what are we going to do with it? Because Frank was right. The, the, the things were there. The ingredients were there. And one of the real focuses is, A, the diversity of our students. Mm -hmm. and, who can change the complexion of the arts in America, you know, um, to more reflect how America is going to look and starting to look and should look. And the other one that they've really worked on is they were all isolated in their own silos. 
music department had no idea what drama was doing until they had to do an opera together and they fought, you know, um, about who were the stars. And the visual arts people were off on their world and the MFA writing program in their world. And so the idea was really to say, how do we integrate these various disciplines? Right. You know, how do we create artists who are multidisciplinary? who understand and respect what the other disciplines are. Which is, by the way, a reflection of the real world, mm -hmm. right? You know, visual artists moving into set design is not new. It's as old as time. Right. All you have to do is go to the Met Opera and look at the Chagall, and it's right, right. it makes the point, right? Um, so, you know, it's really important that artists are trained in such a way that they can operate or segue seamlessly into the real world. It's not unusual for musicians to have to work with right. designers and performers and all the rest of it. If you want to work, and if you're really good at what you do, you're going to have to collaborate. Um, and so I'll use the word twice in one conversation. You have to inculcate that into the artists. And it's not scary. It's actually incredibly mm -hmm. freeing because of what you learn from other artists working in other mm -hmm. disciplines. So that's why the integration that you're talking about and putting the sort of umbrella um, on what you're doing at Queens College is, is really kind of genius um, because it was already there. Yeah. You didn't have to build it. And, and then, you know, as they say, what makes New York pizza or bagels? They say it's the water. You right. know, why you can't replicate it. I, I think when you look at Queens College's history, there's something there when you have a Paul Simon, you know, you have a Carol King, you have a Ray Romano, a Fran Drescher, Marvin Hamlish, Marvin too. Hamlish, yeah. You know, all coming from this school, all from, yeah. you know, coming from this borough, there's something already there in the soil, in the air. And I, when I used to do curtain speeches, we had Gladys Knight or Trevor Noah in our 2100 seat theater. I wouldn't talk about the next show in our 2100 seat theater. I'd say, come see the production of South Pacific, you know, or the opera, because the next Paul Simon is in one of those classes right now. The next Carol King is there, and you're going to see them when they're young and emerging, you know, talents. But they are that talented, and I've seen our students, and yeah. I'm really proud of the work they Jerry do. Jerry Seinfeld, John Seinfeld. Favreau, right. oh, you I'm know. Proud of those two. I That's mean, right. these are folks who are household names. Right. And 25 years ago, 50 years ago, they were sitting in a lecture right. at Queens College, trying to be funny, trying to be creative, right? And it worked out. I'd like to think in some small way, we played a role. Right. I, I'm grateful whenever Jerry Seinfeld wears his Queens sweatshirt. And you know the thing <laughs> they were trying to do 25 years ago? Find a parking spot. Which is a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Big Can, we get same bit. Can you both talk about your backgrounds in, in arts and why you're passionate about it? You're both known for that. Sure. So my father wanted me to be a psychologist. But um, like I said to him, I talk too much. You know, but I want to do the same thing as my father did, which was touch people's souls. So I, I really came into the arts with the belief that we can penetrate, we can have certain experiences as a, as a community together. I fell into arts administration because of, I'm older than you, both of you guys, and art, not-for-profit arts management began to be a field in the mid-70s, and that's when I graduated college. So I, I came into it, I learned a lot of the functions that you need to of raising money because I wanted to do a play with 10 actors, not three actors. And the board only gave me a budget for three actors. I said, well, that's, that's not the play I want to do. So you know, I, I learned many of the skills to really share something that I believed in with other people and um, stayed in the not-for-profit world, though I worked in the commercial world, too. I'm a writer with a day job. <laughs> I actually would like to think of myself as a writer still. I occasionally do an op-ed or a blog. I write a lot of memos. I write more of my own speeches and material than I probably should. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how I got started. I just felt a, a compulsion, an obsession. And I think for many people, you can't not do it, right? So whether your parents approve or not, whether you're being supported or not, even if you have to have a day job, a part of you isn't satisfied, right? You, you can't function unless you do this. And along the way, I've just become interested in every type of art. I'm, I'm an audience member. Uh, yes. uh, I've seen every Shakespeare play performed on stage, for example, even the obscure ones. One of the things I did before the pandemic 
the classical stage company in Manhattan put on stage readings of modern English translations of oh, Shakespeare I remember plays, that. right? Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, Dave Hitz, actually funded this project. And they even did some of the disputed titles. So if there are any Shakespeare buffs or scholars in the audience, uh, Edward III, right? Mm -hmm. So Edward III, right. I think it's about 50-50 uh, among the scholars. Is it Shakespeare? Is it somebody else? Is it probably Shakespeare? That was uh, one of the last ones that I had to see in Two Noble Kinsmen. I flew out to Los Angeles to see Two Noble Kinsmen. This took 25 years, but to see every single <laughs> Shakespeare <Wow. laughs> play on stage shows an obsessiveness. You, you stayed for the end of Titus Andronicus, did you? Oh, Titus Andronicus is great. Uh, and I, I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen it on stage. Not Done. just the wonderful movie <laughs> version by Judy Tamor, but right. on stage. Um, Titus is one of those plays that makes you realize, wow, modern horror movies that people wag their finger at and say, this, this is a bad influence. It's not new. You have not seen anything <laughs> until you have seen Titus Andronicus by William Shakespeare. It is brutal. It can be played as a farce. Yep. But it's got some very important lessons to teach us even to this day mm -hmm. about misguided duty and loyalty, about vengeance. Brutality. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just, it just I, all sorts of things. There's but a that, Julie Taymor Titus, too. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's what yeah, said, with, with yeah. Anthony yeah. Hopkins and Jessica Lange yep, yep. and uh, I forget the rest of the cast. Uh, that, that So if you can't see it on stage, I, I recommend that. If you want to play where you get torn limb from limb, literally, <laughs> this happens in the, in the play. Go ahead, sorry. You were going to say So, uh, so I, I yeah. just love culture, and I love that I'm someplace where there's a museum on campus. We uh, have an artist in residence, Yvonne Short. Um, she's embraced this. Y Yvonne Short's fascinating. You can see her work. She's got about six or seven works, uh, and she's teaching, and her students' works will replace her work. So she's African-American. She's, I think, the third or fourth generation fourth. in her family to have come to Queens College. Her grandfather uh, came from the Deep South, part of the Great Migration, all right, and got educated, raised all these kids, and she's a sculptor. She is, I believe, legally blind, and she's a sculptor, and she's done these works where she's done the whole thing, the sculpture, and then it's on a base uh -huh. that she's made, and the base is mounted on a giant Afro pick. Um, and yeah. one of the reasons she's done that, so p part of that, that's part of the work, right? It's part of, it's her family story, it's the African American story. But the idea is, so she's going to be an artist in residence, mm -hmm. her students will create work, she's going to remove her sculpture, so it, it comes off, but they're going to keep the base and the Afro picks and then put her students' work on oh, top. Oh, wonderful. And then rotate around among the students. So she's helping them, and she's self-taught. She's amazing. She actually, I think, was trained in economics or mathematics. So yeah. another example of more than one yeah. skill set. Uh, but she's devoted uh, her life to art, to making art that tells a story that we want to tell, that needs to be told, that deserves to be told. But 50 years ago, probably most museums, most places, wouldn't have thought that her family's story, that this story, that's a quintessential story of uh, the black experience in the United States in the 20th century. I'm not sure that, that it would have been put into a public space. A and we embrace that and want that to inspire our students. Mm -hmm. How do you, I'm going to go off script here, but I have to ask you a follow-up question. How do you determine who's going to be artist in residence? Like, what what are some of the, you know, driving factors and criteria uh, I'll, I'll in terms of Jeff. programming, Jeff? So that's funny because I literally, Yvonne introduced us when we get onto Queens Rising. I'll go back to Yvonne for a second, to another artist, and um, I'm going. How do we decide who to pick? And. Um, Yvonne, because we recognize at Queens College, we want our student population to look like the demographics of our borough. And the one population that we don't properly reflect is the African-American 
population. We're only about 10, 9 to 11, 12 percent, while the borough's population is closer to 20 percent. So when I met Yvonne, an African-American artist with real credibility as an installation artist and four generations of Queens College, and this wonderful idea of the Afropix and replacing her work with students' work, and not just visual arts students. She's working with psychology and science students. We felt that this was a really wonderful way of coming back from the pandemic for students to see something, and also African-American students to see that we are holding in high esteem an African-American artist and her story you know, and her, of, her, of her, her family. So one that's the, how we chose her. One of the things I also know you're doing, this will bring us to Queen's Rising, which is next on the list, um, is the way that you're engaging cultural institutions and other nonprofit organizations all across the borough. So in other words, um, now that I know a little bit more about that, in my head, I'm thinking, OK, how do we work together, J. Cal and you, to bring audiences and and uh, you know learn about the students and all the rest of it. So that'll be that'll be after the cameras are off. But I'm sitting here thinking about mm -hmm. it, right? But uh, I do want to talk about Queens Rising. It's two years in the making, or ju just about two, at least since I've been around. Yeah. Um, so could you talk a little bit about about what it is, why it is, and it's it's happening in June. So it's what's today the 18th? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so 13 days, days from yeah. now, it's Queens Rising time finally. Um, the souffle, that is arts and culture in Queens, <laughs> is finally rising. Um, tell us about it. So I, I think when I first came to the college, where Frank talked about it before, President Jim Meiskins came to me and said, how can Queens College be the best art center for Queens? And they asked me to write a vision statement. You know, but again, that resounded with me for Queens, not to be the best art center in New York City, best art center in the world. You know, it really took, we really came to the conclusion that one, while we had the largest venue, we also needed to be in the neighborhood where our students and families live and work, doing a lot of off-site. And two was to be collaborators with organizations like J.Cal, Flushing Town Hall, Queens Theater, the Chocolate Factory. And we really felt that we could take a leadership role because we had more resources. You know, we had students, we had faculty, someone like me that wasn't running a theater day to day, you know, to get involved. And we formed an arts advisory board. And then that board had people from the Parks Department and JCAL and other organizations. And through a discussion of theirs saying, what do we do to make our borough better? What we as an organization, we've brought other people together. We don't expect to do it alone. What can we do? And a, a new a member of our staff, John Yanofsky, who came from Brooklyn to run the Performing Arts Center, just brought up the vague idea of doing something over a certain period of time to show our own selves, the artists, the arts organizations, the people living in Queens, and the greater metro area, because we know we stand in the shadow of this big borough, a little borough called Manhattan. Let's do something that really celebrates Queens. So we put together a committee of people on that arts advisory board, and then we went, you know what, we need to be more reflective of the borough geographically, ethically. So we formed a committee of about 12 people. And Leonard sits on it as to Courtney. I said, what do we do? And we said, let's amplify everything Queens is. And we said, it's going to take some money to do that. So let's do it two years from now. This is all pre-pandemic. So we have some time to really think it through and to raise the money. And then the pandemic hit. And we met every other Tuesday morning all the time. And I'd say we'd have anywhere from 75 to 100% participation at every one of these meetings, because we needed each other. We needed to com communicate with each other on a smaller level, like Culture at Three was formed by one of our Queens colleagues, Taryn Sacramone at Queens Theater in the Park, I took over for me. Um, but we needed it to be closer, more of a community, because as you say, politics is local, so is art. And we needed to share our own experiences and our own stories within our borough and to figure out what we could do together for Queens, for Queens arts organizations, for Queens artists, and for the Queens community. And then Phil Ballman, Borough Hall, came up with the name Queens Rising, which we borrowed because it wasn't original. But the idea of let's have Queens rise out of this pandemic. And as you said before, what's the canary in the, you know, in the, in the coal mines? It's the arts. So let us be the leaders. Let us really bring this borough back to life with a month-long initiative 
of cold Queens Rising in June 2022. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, not just in New York City, but in Queens. I, I wouldn't trade the job I have for any other job in the City University of New York system, which spans all five boroughs. You, you know, if Queens were on its own, we'd be either the fourth or fifth largest city in the United States. That's right. This is That's right. a sizable metropolis all on its own. Uh, I live just a, a mile south of campus, so I, I'm in the neighborhood. And that's part of making a commitment of saying, look, this is where I belong. This is my commitment to the institution, to the community, to, to the people. Right. And I, I revel in everything that's going on in Queens. This, this to me, this is New York City at its most real mm -hmm. and at, at its best. I, I was helping some people. They were doing a, a search for a, a different organization for, for a, a job. And I read their... Uh, job description, and uh, it mentioned Queens. It said, best known for the two airports. And I thought, you can't <laughs> describe Queens this That's way. That's not this a compliment is, either. This is <laughs> not how to lead in attracting someone to come take this job in Queens. You know, that has to be rewritten. You know, so, so I, I wrote like a note. It said, the, the, you, whatever you do, this is not the first sentence of your description of where this job is. Would anybody write that Manhattan has two of the best bus stations in the, in the whole world? And, yeah, I think part of that, when I first came to Queens Theater in the Park, it was like 1989, there was a New Yorker cartoon of this very stuffy Upper East Side older couple. And you could see you know, the cartoon with the, their wardrobe was just impeccable and expensive. And they're sitting in the back of the cab going, We've never been to Queens before without our luggage. You know? <laughs> and I took that picture, and I stuck it on my desk. And, and I'm not going to be pro use profanity, but I said, I don't give a flying you-know-what about those two you-know-what people. I'm going to serve the 2.3 million wonderful people that you just talked about that live in our borough that deserve the very, very best, and works that speak to them not works that are pre-Broadway when I'm running a theater. And so I think Queens Rising, all of us are saying, there are such amazing artists, organizations, activities that you can do in Queens. So we're going to pick one month and just show you the volume, the, you know, the scope, the breadth you know, of how robust you can do anything you know, from visual arts, performing arts, children's shows, you know, outdoor stuff in one month. And then figure out, you know what? It's going to be here in July, that same level of activity in August and September. And we hope that if you're a member of JCAL, that JCAL is promoting what's happening at Queen's Theater. And someone will go, I've never been there before. Let me test that out. I'm seeing stuff all over the place in terms of media, marketing right now. Hey, Queen's has got a lot going on. If you can make it in Queen's, you can make it anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's, uh, every day I think about that when I come to work. Um, I'll tell you a true story. This is also off script, but I'll share it anyway. 18, 19 years ago, um, I, I grew up, you know where I grew up. I lived in Manhattan for a long time. Then I moved to Astoria. And um, Astoria is very fertile ground for people working in arts and culture. Absolutely. And you can ride the N train or the W train and, and sort of sense that. And I, was, I directed a couple of plays with a, a friend, um, actor. Um, she was living not far from me at all. But we, we would have this conversation over and over again. And it led to. Talking about Brooklyn, that's that other borough. It's the it's the connected to the landmass, and um, and I'm pretty partial to Queens, as you can tell. But you know, one one can't help but notice that you know Williamsburg popped and Bushwick popped, right? Now, um, uh, and what when do you know that a place is going to pop? Right? This is not to get into a conversation about gentrification, which is a whole fraught right. issue, which is not what we're talking about. Just limiting it to the it's idea the that artists uh, always seek a cheaper place to live. <laughs> um, artists are always going to revitalize a community economically and socially. And um, how do you know? So we, on a lark, and the only, there was no social media, the only thing that existed was Craigslist. So we put a, a, put a thing in Craigslist, and we decided to call this little thing to see if anybody would show up. There's a coffee bar on Dittmar's Boulevard. And we decided to call this thing Borough of Queens United Artist Collective Kumbaya, huh. or BQAC, <laughs> just to see if anybody would show up. 40 people showed up. 
and that one was a painter, and that one was a, a, in a band, and that, you know, and so forth and so on, right? So it was like, we said it was a thing, and it so it became a thing. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I loved about Queen's Rising from the moment I heard about it was very simply, you're putting a flag down and saying, we're here. It's the Burroughs moment. Um, and simply by doing that, uh, it's now a thing. Mm -hmm. It's the bee quack of the post-pandemic period. Right. Yep. And that is about as unscripted yep. as it's ever going to get. And two examples. One of our planning committee members right around the holidays, Christmas, said, you know, we should all get together in yeah. a place. And I was like, oh, it's going to be cold. Who's going to show up? But we did Woodlots. I never even heard of this bar. And, um, in, in Woodside. Wood, in Woodside. You were there. About 40 people came because we wanted to be part of the community. Yeah. We wanted to say hello to each other. We wanted to be in a public place. We wanted to share a drink. And then taking it to the next level, we just had the launch of Queens Rising at the Queens Museum. There were 120 people at 9 o'clock in the morning you know, from the arts community coming out to say, we're part of this. You know, we, we, we do have a community. We belong together. We need to interact. Another part of Queens Rising, in addition to just amplifying all the activity, is to build that community. You know, we don't have an arts council that says, I'm going to put all this stuff together. So we had to do it on our own. We wanted people to network to say, hey, you're an artist. You're looking for a space. You know what? I know Flushing Town Hall's director. We just met together. Let me write an introduction. Send me an email. You know, it's to build that sense of community among each other. I have a note about uh, the Chen family gift to support students and artists. Do you want to talk about that? Sure, sure. There's a, an entrepreneur named Thomas Chen. And what's great about this endowment he set up, he's not one of our graduates. Now, the truth is most donors to any college are graduates. Right? But he's a business person in Queens. And he believes in what we believe in, which is this borough. He's an immigrant entrepreneur, came here from Taiwan, he had nothing, built this window company that's one of the largest privately held companies in, in New York City. Uh -huh. It's called Crystal. When you go around, you, you look at the buildings going up, uh -huh. you'll see their logo. You know, they, it, oh, wow. Houses, you know, they sell to individual homeowners, but the big buildings are going up, all these Crystal windows. That's how he made his money. Hard-working guy, he and his family, they still run this business, they manufacture right here in Queens. And he's always supported the arts. And he knew that we were building this art school. And Jeff and I met him, we saw how much he's a patron of the arts. He commissioned a sculpture, a life-size sculpture of uh, Borough President Claire Shulman uh -huh. when she passed away. He has a, a place upstate that's an arts preserve where he commissions all, yeah, Crystal Park. He commissions all these wow. avant-garde works, right? And he said, you're starting an art school. I'd like to, to support it. I'd like to invest in it. So he gave us an endowment, which means it will last forever. Right. And here's what we're doing with it. This year, we'll have a show uh, that's focused on contemporary Asian art. Mm -hmm. That's his passion. Next year, we'll have uh, an artist in residence. The year after that, we'll give out scholarships. Then we'll repeat it again oh. and again and again. Show artist scholarships. And we're probably one of the very few schools. I don't know how many schools have an endowment to support contemporary Asian art. And it came from someone who had humble beginnings. And for him, our mission, what we're about, it resonates because even though he didn't go to Queens College, he sees himself in our students and he hires our students too. So it's, it's just a great, great story. There was a wonderful student who spoke when we celebrated his gift, um, also an Asian American student who came here and found that the language barrier was very difficult, but not when she was a visual artist. You know, and there she could communicate with other artists and with the audiences through that particular medium versus a language. You know, and it was beautiful, her remarks. Now, there's a final question that I have for both of you. But before we get to that, I'm going to ask you a question that I wasn't going to ask you. And I'm going to ask you it now, because you, you just talked about someone who's a patron of the arts, right? Um, not born here, came here with very little, did incredibly well. And for whatever reason that I'm, that I'm sure is uh, particular to his background and his interests, he's a patron of the arts. And that's extraordinary um, gestures. 
how do we create a society of people that all want to be patrons of the arts? Not everybody's going to be a sculptor or a composer or a dancer or whatever, setting aside the question about or the topic of creativity and self-expression. But we need a society that is full of people like that. We need more of them. Um, one of the things uh, I did a little arts administration teaching a number of years ago, there's a $9 trillion wealth transfer happening in society, probably interrupted a little bit by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But the percentage, in absolute dollars, there will be more money for arts and culture. But as a percentage of overall philanthropy in the, in the nation, it's getting smaller and smaller. So this wealth transfer sounds like a you know, tremendous boon for arts and culture, but in fact it's not if it's becoming a smaller percentage of a somewhat larger pie. Mm -hmm. How do we create a society of audience members? You know, how do we, patrons, how do we do that? I'll, I'll take a stab. I, you know, when I went to school in Binghamton, the big question was if a child is in kindergarten, let's say not kindergarten, let's say junior high school in Binghamton, New York, do you bring them to the Binghamton Opera? Or do you bring the Metropolitan Opera there? You got one shot, that kid. You know, you're going to transform them. And hopefully, the Binghamton Opera would be wonderful. But I think the example of the Kupferberg family. Max Kupferberg made a $10 million, at that point, the largest gift ever to Queens College, to find the Max and Selma Kupferberg Center for the Arts. He was a physicist. <laughs> he took physics at Queens College. And they offered him three opportunities. They said, we can name an endow a seat for you for $5 million in physics. We can name the science building for you for $7 million. Or this is all before my time. Or you can name the art center for $10 million. They went to a physicist. He goes, let me go home and talk to my wife. He came back two days later and said, the $10 million for the arts, because the impact of the arts. So how we can do it, I think, is if we could really, if, we could, if artists do their thing, and touch people's souls, people are moved. And you know, when you make a generous offer, it's not a calculated thing. It's an emotional response to something. It's an understanding of the impact of something. So I think the better the artists, the better our chances of getting money to support arts. And through education, so many of the people you meet who are, say, opera singers, or just opera buffs, you get to talking to them. How, how did you? develop this passion. You find out it's when they were nine years old, their grandparents right. took them one afternoon to a matinee, and they were hooked, right? Or it was a high school field trip, right? So uh, one of my dearest friends uh, is someone who's a high school teacher, taught humanities. And if it weren't for that exposure more than 40 years ago, I wouldn't have developed the, the same love that I have for for all of the arts. And even if you're not a patron with millions of dollars to give, if you just buy a ticket, that makes you a patron. Of course, right? of course. Uh, and people want to support the arts. Uh, you know, uh, the composer Tchaikovsky, he, he had a patron, uh, Madame von Meck, who supported him through his entire life on the condition that they never meet. I think they bumped into one another accidentally at a train station and recoiled in horror and went their <laughs> separate ways. Uh, and they corresponded. And she supported him because uh, she was a widow, her husband had made a lot of money, and she liked his work. She cared about the arts. She wanted to see more of that work produced. And not every one of us is going to find a patron who just supports us generously to be creative. I'm still looking, just but so you know. all of us, every now and then, can be a patron in our own way. Sure. And just to do that is so important. Because maybe we'll take along a kid who will grow up one day to be the big benefactor. And all of us need art. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what our walk of life. We need something to nourish the soul that way. And to be able to help transmit that knowledge, those skills to the next generation, that's what we're here to do. Just to build on that very quickly, the reason why I'm sitting here is because my public school in Kew Gardens Hills in the 70s when there were cuts and there were 50 kids in a classroom, but there was always arts. 
there was always theater. There was always uh, there was a dance festival every year. I was not destined to be doing that. But it wasn't about whether you're going to become a great dancer or not. It was about collaboration um, and instruction and creativity and all the rest of it. And specifically to me, um, a teacher walked in the room and he wrote uh, original and adapted plays and musicals for kids. And um, he was, uh, he was a, a veteran of World War II, lived in Belrose for a gazillion years. And he wrote radio plays. And we were always doing something. It will shock all of you to know that I felt very comfortable on stage. Um, and so I, you know, I auditioned for that, and I auditioned for that. And it was, you know, we did our play. And we did it at night. It was really exciting. It wasn't just during <laughs> the day for the other kids. It was for the parents, you know? And I remember it was the fourth grade, and I came off the stage, and I went up to my parents, and I said, I want to be an actor, per what you said earlier. These are the last words a parent wants to hear. Um, but I was bitten by the theater bug in that moment. And it was the applause. <laughs> I won't deny that. But it was also character and interacting with other people and learning how to move on stage and doing all the rest of that. It was having arts education when I was young. Because my real fear is that when somebody is uh, 19 or 21 or 25, it's potentially too late. I mean, I would like to think it's never too late. But I would much rather make sure there's arts education for young people. We, we need that. We're building on that foundation. Absolutely. I cut you off, Jeff. I'm sorry. No, I, I was just going to say to the audience is, I always say it's more fun to do theater than it is to watch theater. But you, hands down. <laughs> How much theater have you done? It's more fun to do it than to watch it. And uh, actually, I've enjoyed my best theater directing was working as a counselor in a camp with kids you know, versus all the professional productions I've done with all the TV stars and all that stuff. It's working and just getting people engaged in that process. But the audience is a key player in making theater. You know, if, if there's no response, there's nothing going on on that stage, you know, with the actor and the audience. And the actor cannot do their thing without that audience member being there, too. You know, but um, I love the theater. For me, I get chills every time I say curtain going up. Sure. Curtain going up. And you know, oh my God, something's going to happen here. You know, and I'm, I'm here. You know, and that actor's job is to transport you. You know, you just had dinner, you had a fight with your wife, the waiter didn't give you, you know, gave you a look, and all of a sudden the curtain's going up, and this poor guy up here, a woman, has got to transform you and take you away from all that, and bring you someplace special. You know, and it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. So I guess my last question for you both is a variation on what we talked about as the last question. Is there anything about the vitality of Queens that we haven't talked about that we should hit on in this conversation? I mean, I would say, for example, give your free shot. Um, I think the business community is really strong. When you were talking about Mr. Chen, we don't necessarily all talk about the vitality of the business community in Queens. I think it's important that we connect the business community to the cultural community. These things are not all siloed and whatever. Is there anything else? I mean, you're living here now. And you've lived here at a particularly unique mm -hmm. moment in time, as you know more than, more than I do. Um, is there something about the vitality of the borough that we haven't sort of made sure to punch? Go for us again. We, go after we you. can be a model for the world. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, you know, diversity is not easy. There's <laughs> friction, there's tension. Not only this community, that community, but communities where outsiders would say, wait a minute, I, I don't get it. You're fighting. Aren't you the same community? And they'd be, no, no, we're not the same community. Not at all. E even though 99% of the world would say, I, I, I don't get it at all. You're the same ethnicity. You're the same faith. But there's some subtle distinction here that causes you to really not like the other community. And you <laughs> see yourselves as not at all like them, right? Yet in Queens, we've sort of held it together. And there are a lot of places in the world that aren't holding it together, where the forces of division have overwhelmed the forces of unity. And so I look at this, maybe this is idealistic. I look at a place like the Queens College campus, where and we've got to keep working at it. I know this is not automatic. It's not magical. We, we face our own issues. We had some anti-Semitic and racist graffiti, and we got to deal with that and deal with it resolutely and use it as a teaching moment. 
But I think we're doing pretty well compared to a lot of other places where the, the kind of real hatred people have put aside because they see that they have a common cause. They've all come from someplace else here. And now their neighbors and coworkers might not eat the same food, might not worship the same day of the week, but their neighbors and coworkers identify with this American dream, right? And the Queen's version of it is especially powerful. So that's what we need to, to do, uh, promote the forces of unity and, and be a model the world over. I don't know, less <laughs> noble scale, but you know, I, I grew up in Brooklyn. I spent many, many years living in Manhattan. I almost came fighting into Queens. You know, my wife, I married my wife and moved to Queens. And, but I discovered that Queens is still a wonderful frontier. You know, Manhattan is so done. You know, it, it's, it's so overrated. It's so done. Brooklyn already, too, is, you know, is past its prime. And Queens is where there's still an opportunity to discover. I remember Alan Friedman from the Hall of Science who passed away many years ago. And we were talking one day, and I was at the theater. And, and he said, you know, our responsibility is to try and fail. The Metropolitan Museum cannot fail when they mount an exhibit. You know, th there's too much at risk. They're, they're a major icon. but. There's not going to be works coming, you know, of new works coming, unless we in Queens try, and sometimes we're going to fail. But we have to support these new emerging artists, these new audiences, and, and we can hit and miss, and we can afford to do that, and it's our responsibility to do that too, you know, to really create new audiences, create new, support new artists. And I think Queens can really do that. Claire Shulman once said to me, the former bar president, you know why we have so many immigrants in Queens? I go, why, Claire? She said, because when they got off of Idlewild Airport, which is Kennedy Airport, she goes, they got in the cab, and all of a sudden they saw how expensive it was to go to Manhattan. They said, stop, stop, I'll live right here. You know? they'll, they'll set up. But we do have all these different communities, and I agree with you. Even 15 years ago, I said, we're going to, Queens is what America is going to look like in 2050. And, and we have to show the rest of the world we can do it and, you know, and, and live that way you know, and live with each other. Perfectly cadenced. Um, Frank, Jeff, thank you for being with us tonight. Our friends here in the audience, please feel free to chat with our guests. Our friends watching on the live stream and in future, click on YouTube, press play, <laughs> whatever that's called. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks. A pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Hey, bye.